How excited are you? We've got another new book coming out. Yes. It's middle grade, which my other books have been. It's about someone called Clara, who is very small and really unimportant, and she gets bossed around and bullied endlessly by her aunts and her, her cousins and her sisters. And she decides that she wants to change things. And the thing is, she's... Uh, she loves watching television. She's, she's this big fan of these two major television series that she watches about, um, about detectives. So she decides that she's going to become a famous television detective and then she will be important and her aunts and cousins and sisters will love her. And the trouble is she's a chook. Okay. And so no one takes her seriously, you know, this chook who wants to be a detective, um, until she teams up with the daughter of the town policeman. They live in this town called Little Dismal. And, um, and she teams up with the daughter of the town's policeman who also doesn't take her seriously at first. Uh, but then they both set out to solve a particular crime. And I've, I've just, I've, I've recently oh. had the, um, the, the advanced copy and I just love this cover. This, this That's is so good. That's so cute. Isn't so it cute? good. It's, the cover is Cheryl Orsini. And, uh, and she's done a whole stack of illustrations in the inside. You know, these wonderful illustrations of, of Clara trying to, trying to do Morse code and, and trying to do semaphore and all these sorts of things. So I, I just think it's lovely. It's, it's oh. totally different from anything I have ever written before. I was going to say, you've, like, taken a big step there. I what, in, what inspired that? I, up till now, apart from the picture book, I have always written trilogies. I've, I've written kind of fantasy adventure trilogies. And I, and I love the trilogy form. I, I, love that, uh, I love that long form because you can do such interesting things over three books, you know. And I always get to the end of the first book and I think, even if I was intending to write it as a standalone, I get to the end of the first book and I think I am not finished with these characters, you know. I'm, I'm not willing to let them go yet. So... Um, so everything has become a trilogy, even when I didn't mean it to. But the other thing about trilogies is that they take ages to write. They take, you know, three years at a minimum. And when I was writing my most recent trilogy, which was The Rogues, I kept finding that I had ideas for new books that I really wanted to pursue. Um, but it was three years, two years, a year, before I could even start taking it seriously, you know. So... I started to think I really, really do want to write a standalone. And this one, I don't want it to be a standalone that then turns into a trilogy. So I started thinking about a standalone. And I also wanted to write a shorter book because my fantasy novels turn out, I, I seem to have this, this natural story length when I write that sort of story of around about mm -hmm. 60,000 words. And that's fine for confident readers and, and kids yeah. who just love to immerse themselves in a book. But for kids who aren't quite so confident about reading, that 60,000 mm. words looks enormous, you know, to, to even... Yeah, for the age group, it's always a hit and you never quite know, do you, which yeah. way so, they're going to go. So mm. I thought, well, I, I wanted to write something shorter. And I thought, okay, around about 40,000 words, that sounds nice. And this came out at... I think about 38,000 and, okay. and it's, it's slightly younger than my other yeah. book. Um, yep. So it's laid out differently. It's laid out, you know, kind of bigger, bigger, slightly bigger words, fewer words yeah. on the page, all that sort of stuff. And I think it's just that bit more accessible for kids who aren't such confident readers. Plus it's really funny. <laughs> <laughs> now look, I've, I've heard a very well-known writer say, you are not supposed to laugh at your own jokes. And I find... You should. I, find, I know. I find, if you don't laugh, oh, how is anyone else going to laugh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yep. I think that if I'm still laughing at it or after six, seven, eight drafts, then other people yep. will laugh too. No, I absolutely agree. Yeah, so, yeah you should. Yeah, yeah. so this, this was huge fun to write. You know that thing where... You find a character with such a strong voice, such an enormously strong voice that, that they almost write themselves. Not, not completely, yeah. but they're a joy to write and, and 
their, the way they speak and the way they think mm. is so clear uh, mm. and so different from everybody else. Well, that's, that was how Clara turned out. She's, she's this funny little chook who takes herself immensely seriously. And I, I love that the cover seems to be exactly representative of what's inside. It is. You know, every, everything you've said about the book... Yes. It, to me, I, when I, if I, you know, saw the cover, that's what I would think I was getting. So I really love that. I love how they do that. You know, it's a yeah, talent, exactly. isn't it? And again, completely different from all my other covers. Which it, yeah. because, and it says this is not what Lee and Tanny usually writes. You know, you sort of look at this and think, wow, okay, that's different. The thing is, I love writing animals. I, I really love writing. Uh, I, I, I always have an animal in my books. Um, it's just kind of something. I, I think I, I grew up with um, the Jungle Book, with oh, talking animals, yeah. and, and with um, C.S. Lewis's Narnia books. And so for me, talking animals are this kind of essential part of, mm. of, 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 a, of a fantasy novel. Um, and, and they're such fun to write. And when I was writing The Rogues, I actually had a chook in The Rogues, um, only she wasn't really a chook. She was really an ancient sorceress who had got caught up in one of her own spells and had forgotten who she was. But she was also enormous fun to write. So I kind of think Clara, you know, Clara was, the, the birth of Clara began some way back. There's chickens get into your blood. You've got to watch out with chickens, I found, in the real world as well as in books. There's so, some of my favourite picture books are chicken books. like. And I just think there's something about them that's just mesmerising. And when we've had chickens, we don't at the moment, but when we've had chickens, yeah, they're I, just, I, I love don't them. At the moment. I know, I don't at the moment, but I, I had them a couple of years ago, a few years ago. And when I got them, I, it was years since I'd had chooks and I had forgotten how funny they were. You know, I just, I'd forgotten how you could sit out in the back garden and just watch them and yes. laugh. And, yep. and just yep. enjoy them because they are they are their own people completely. Oh, they are. Yeah. Yeah. My mum has new chickens because she's often, she goes through them. You know, they've had them for years and for a long time. Big, they've got properties. And the latest ones are very bossy and they just walk will walk straight up to you and, you know, and have a look at what you're doing. Big Isa Browns. Uh, and my daughter was just besotted with them. And the way they fought over a little piece of toast and the three, she named them all. By the time they she'd left, she'd named every single one, identified their personalities, and mostly down to this piece of toast that they'd fought over. And yeah, chickens are great. They do have such strong personalities, don't they? Yeah, they do. Strong personalities. My chooks, the last lot that I had, um, because I also have a cat called Harry, Harry LeBeau, Harry the Hat, <laughs> and um, and he's he's this long silver hair, long silver hair boy uh, who likes having his tummy rubbed, very laid back sort of boy. Um, and he really didn't know what to make of the chooks, but he, he got used to them. But they, every now and again, they would traumatise him because he'd be sitting out in the back garden. I was watching them one day and he was sitting out in the back garden and he had just caught a mouse in this clump of grass. And he was sitting there about to eat this mouse because he doesn't play with his food. He, he, he came to me as a stray. So he... Yeah. Um, he, you know, he grabs his food and he, and he eats it. So he grabbed this mouse and he was just about to chomp it down. And one of my chooks raced up to him, snatched the mouse away from him, out of his mouth, and then went tearing around the backyard with the other two chooks staring after her, trying to get the mouse off her. And every now and then she'd stop when she got the not far away head, she'd stop and she'd bash the mouse against something to kill it. And then she'd take off again before the other chooks could catch up with her. And Harry's sitting there going, Where's my mouse? Where's my mouse? Why did a chicken take Where my mouse? Where'd my mouse go? <laughs> Why would a chicken want a mouse? <laughs> That's a oh yes, writing writing about chooks. Having chooks is fun. Writing about chooks is also fun. Wow, that's amazing. I'm go, I've got to figure out how to tell that to my seven-year-old daughter without traumatising her. It's a little bit, that's going to be tricky. <laughs> you could also, your seven-year-old daughter might like this too. Another time, Harry was standing in the back garden. He was sunning his bottom at his tail mm. high up in the air. And he, he was standing with his back to the sun and kind of warming up his bum. And um, 
And, and Floss, who was the, kind of the bossiest of the three chooks, she was walking up behind him and she was, she was eyeing him. And you know how chooks will pick at anything to see if it's edible? She walked up behind him, she picked him right on the bum. And Harry just flew. He oh flew no. Out of there. <laughs> Anyone would if they got a peck on the bum. I know. I know. <gasps> okay, right. That's amazing. We had, we didn't, yeah, we have dogs now, so we can't have the chickens because I can't trust dogs around chickens. Uh, no. um, and they're not, they're not farm dogs. They're like completely pampered indoor um, prince type dogs. So, and no, and I nursed, a chi- I nursed two chickens um, to their demise. I've watched one being eaten by a carpet snake. I've had, I've had a lot of chicken drama in my life, but they were all very well treated whilst they were with us. Um, yeah. And it's so hard to make a chicken do something it doesn't want to do. Yeah. They're so stubborn. I'm I think ch- chickens oh. do bring drama with them, I think. Yeah. They're, and they're so fragile too. You know, they, they, they die very easily, which is, which is horrible. They do it Wednesday. The chicken, we had a chicken called Wednesday. These are some we inherited called Wednesday, Lavender and Chili. And it, yeah, Wednesday was the most stubborn. Yeah. Um, of the lot so yeah it was all a little bit it's it's always a, just an adventure you never know but i've seen my children watch the chickens you know mm-hmm. when they were all little they all watched varieties of chickens and they just find them fascinating but obviously um slightly different to one who's going to be a detective um so do you have a love of detective stories um i, I have a love of most stories i <laughs> detect Detective stories are one of the things that I really love reading. Yes, I, I love fantasy. I love detective stories. I love romance. I love children's stories. I love the whole thing, you know. Yeah. Um, but yes, I, I really like a good detective story, and I really like that that thing of seeing how a story unwinds and, and what you mm. didn't know at the beginning, and and what the reader knows that the detective doesn't know, and all those sorts of stuff. So, so yes, you know, I, I really do like detective stories. Did you find it hard to keep things? This is, I'm terrible at this. I tried to write a mystery. It was a disaster because I just want to tell everything right at the beginning. So did you find it hard to keep details from the reader? And to do so, did you have to keep them from Clara? Yes. I, I wrote, it's, it's very close uh, first person. Um, so, so Clara tells part of the story and Olive, who is the policeman's daughter, also tells part of the story in the form of letters. Uh, and so it's very, very clear. They're both talking in the first person. And so it's, it's only what they know. Um, yeah. But Clara believes she knows some things that Olive doesn't know. So Clara, as far as Clara's concerned, she's the detective and Olive's her sidekick. Yeah. So, um, so, and so she has all these theories and she has all these ideas about about humans that are just slightly skewed from reality you know she she believes certain things that um that that aren't real and that was kind of part of the part of the fun of writing it that that how a chook would see certain things uh i can't wait i'm so excited (laughs) (laughs) and i'm so glad so my seven-year-old daughter would be a good audience your yeah. seven-year-old daughter would be a perfect age for it. Yeah, right. She's not quite. I don't think she's not sure she's quite old enough for the other series yet. Although she's reading up in some ways, it's hard to know which ways sometimes until you get into the book, and then she's like, "Nope," or "Yes, give me more." So you know. But this sounds, and it also to read independently or read to, because I'm not sure she's. She normally has the big no, uh, trilogies I read to her by her dad, who's a very devoted reader to her. He spends hours. Um, and then, but there are some books she needs, she reads independently. So she, this one she might read on her own. I reckon yeah. she'd have a good, she'd certainly be worth a try. Um, yeah, no, she, and she's very capable, but she, you know, she needs something at school to have, she always has a book on her desk and in her tidy tray. And in fact, it's the most often thing I get complaints about from the teacher. She gets in trouble a lot. And so did my son, actually, my older son, for reading oh. during class. <laughs> Oh, whilst well, being I can, taught <laughs> I can understand that. so I do get it yeah I get it and then I always <laughs> sort of, I always sort of say but did she do the work anyway like did she get it 
and do oh, they say yes? Like, was there a problem? Oh, yeah, but they still, and I understand it can be disturbing to the other students and things, but it's a bit funny. I do, I start laughing because I'm like, what an awesome problem. I know, I know. It's lovely, isn't it? It's like that cartoon of the, um, of the, of the parent who says to her, her son, you are, you are not allowed to read in bed. You absolutely must not read that book in bed. And so, of course, you know, the kid yeah. goes and reads in bed and the mother's outside the door sniffing to herself because yeah. that, was, that was her intention. <laughs> That's pretty much our family. My, the bookmark, my daughter's favourite bookmark says, I read past my bedtime. And so she's lovely. got that as her declared thing that she will do. Um, but it's lovely when you see the books on the desks in the morning when they go into class and they've all got something out. So hopefully she'll be having Clara there to, and then you wait because all the others look over and they're like, oh, what have you, what have you got? That's lovely. I was, I was reading something a while back, an American author who's one of Pulitzer, I know her name escaped me for the moment, um, but she was talking about when she was a child and how she read as a child and you know how she was one of those obsessive readers as a child read read while you get dressed read while you walk to school all that sort of stuff which rang so many bells for me and sounds as if it would ring bells for your daughter as well it, yeah <laughs> um, and she was talking about how in reading like that in reading so obsessively and in rereading the books that you love you you internalize a really strong sense of story you internalise a really strong sense of what works and what doesn't work and, and you don't even know you're doing it at the time, but that this is what grows a writer. This is, yeah. this is, what, um, this, this is the background for writers, that, that, that burying yourself in story yeah. and, and learning about it without even realising that you're learning it's, about it. It's like learning the song but not learning the words even. You just have learnt what it should sound like. And that's what I found when I was first writing and I just found I can read, I could read it and think, no, but there's, you know, you just feel like it's Mr. Beat or it's, it's missed the tunes a little off or there's something wrong there, but you've just, you just have absorbed that. Yeah. And, it's, and it has become, you, you absorb it to the point that it becomes instinct. Yeah. And, and I know, um, there's an, another American writer, Jennifer Cruzy, who writes uh, romance, sort of light-hearted romance, lovely writer. And she, I follow her blog because it's a terrific blog and she has a lot of, um, lot of writing advice on it. She, she talks about her writing as she writes, which I find really interesting. Mm -hmm. And she, she, is, um, she writes her first draft completely instinctively. Uh, whatever comes, you know, and then she goes back and for her second and third and fourth drafts, she is so technical. She is amazingly technical. So she breaks everything down into beats and she looks at, you know, kind of where where the climax of each beat is within each scene yeah. and, and all this sort of stuff, you know, like to an astonishing degree. And I can't do that and I don't particularly want to do that. It's really interesting to read about. Um, but... I think I do that. That's what I do instinctively. And, and I don't, uh, she probably, I, I don't know, she probably discovers things that I don't discover because she does it so technically. But maybe I discover stuff that she doesn't discover because I yeah. do that instinctively. And I'm sure she's got the same instinct from, you know, from all that reading. But yeah. I find it really interesting the way different writers approach this so differently. Yeah. And I, I, I had to go technical at one point because I knew I needed something and I, but I didn't know where or, mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't know what was wrong with it. And so I did have to go to, and I found, I found someone who had the most technical, like it was so it's formula to the point of, you know, which oh. is not anything like my novel, but right. I needed that. And I needed that specificity. And then it, I didn't use the whole thing. I just found, you know, the, the one or two lines that made sense to me that I needed to go back and check. And they were mm -hmm. the ingredients that I'd missed and it's my own avoidance of conflict or something like that where I've gone do 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 or I don't want them to make a, a wrong decision because that wouldn't be sensible. <laughs> or You're not cruel enough. Um, no. And this is, you know, it's like the uh, Lily Wilkinson was saying about how you put your character up a tree and you throw apples at them and then they climb down again. It's and she was this not her metaphor, but I do like it. And I'm not very good it, at throwing the apples. Yeah. I'd be more likely to throw them a drink. <laughs> but look, isn't it interesting because because I was aware of this when I was reading a book the other day and I, I was 
I was thinking about what was happening to this character and I really wanted this character to solve this problem really quickly and, and to get out of this situation. But we were only about a quarter of the way into the book and I knew that if they did solve it really quickly, I would actually be disappointed because yeah. we needed to see that journey through the book. So, so there's those, those warring things, aren't there? You know, you, you want them yeah. to get out of the terrible trouble that they're in, but you also want... You want that journey, that that long and wonderful yeah. journey. The, the, the and it can't be, it can't be something that could be solved too quickly. I read a line, and this doesn't. I don't write mysteries myself, but it, at the moment, I tried, as I said, one day. Um, but that it shouldn't be able to be solved with just a conversation, or like if you've had a fight oh. between two characters, it shouldn't be able to be solved very easily. But then you've diverted them, so they can't just be. You can't throw simple apples that no one believes. And so no. it's trying to make those really realistic. And for me, that's where I'll think back to tra my own travels or my own dramas and I'll think, well, what actually went, like, what was that moment where I realised, oh, no, you know, when you first go camping and you forgot the sharp knife or yeah. you're on the aeroplane and you're like, but I don't have a pair of scissors because we're not allowed them. What am I going to do? Those sorts of problems. Uh, and you must have a lot of those because you've had such adventures. Um, do you find, <laughs> do things go wrong and do they help you? Things go enormously, things have gone enormously wrong in most of my adventures. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know whether, that, whether the actual adventures help. You know, I mean, they help in, they help in some ways. I mean, I, I directly use my adventures in some ways. So yeah. um, I, I used my scuba diving. I used the fact that my friends and I were dynamited when we were scuba diving. I used that very directly when I was writing Sunk as Deep, and I was, which was set aboard this little tiny submarine, and, and these people were, were having depth charges dropped on them. Um, and I used, you know, like I, I don't, don't know whether I've ever used anything as directly as that, yeah. as that, as that, um, that experience and that terror. It's trying to work out how you keep going so when something's gone wrong past the problem you know that that mm. that's, which which i always used to be spectacularly bad at as a child you know i kind of oh my god there's a problem <laughs> i give up <laughs> um and i had to learn you know and i think that that adventures teach you um mm. to 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 keep going um so for for example many years ago when i was I suppose I was in my late 30s and I was hitchhiking through France and um, every and I kept getting lifts with truck drivers and every truck driver, every single truck driver asked me to sleep with them. Oh, no. And, and I got, and I, so I kind of, I got up with this spiel, you know, about, about how, no, you know, like, no. I have a disease. <laughs> I have a disease. Yes, that was part of it. Um, I have a husband waiting for me in Paris. What was really weird was that as soon as I had a, said I had a husband waiting for me in Paris, which wasn't at all true, yeah. they, would, they would back off. Oh. They, they didn't care about the fact that I didn't want to sleep with them. They didn't care about all this other stuff. But husband, yep. Husband, Right. But anyway, so one particular one particular occasion, I was um, I had a lift with this, with this truck driver, and we were heading towards this town, this little town where they had a youth hostel, and I was aiming to spend the night there. And it was getting quite late, and um, and he uh, pulled up about twenty kilometres before the town and said, "My, I can't drive any further until I've had an hour's break." You know, they're the rules, they're the uh, regulations. You know? Yeah, and. Um, so I thought, okay, and so I sat there, and he got out his he got out a meal, and he got out his little television and stuck it on the, on the thing on the front on the dashboard. And I don't know whether you've ever seen French television, but I have never seen such sexy advertisements as they yeah. had. Yeah, television. You know, they even then they were way more sexy than what we had on Australian television. Yeah, so I'm sort of sitting there watching these advertisements and then looking at me looking at me and I'm sitting there going oh oh no and in the end I just jumped out of the truck and I, I grabbed my pack and I jumped out of the truck and I said I'm going to keep going and he's leaning out of the truck going you won't get a ride you won't get a ride you may as well stay here with me so I walked around the, I walked around the bend until he couldn't see me anymore then I climbed over the fence and I walked up into this paddock and I put my sleeping bag under a tree and I climbed into it and I went to bed and I woke up woke up the next morning 
and it was raining and there was a herd of cows standing around me staring down at me. <laughs> and I ended up, so I, I climbed out, you know, shoo away to the cows, climbed out of my sleeping bag, walked back down the road, and I was standing by the side of the road with my thumb out, howling with tears. Oh, howling, wishing I was home. But then, of course, I got a ride with the one man who didn't proposition me. Really nice and really friendly, and it was fine. Um, <laughs> I'm sure there are lessons in there and I don't know what they are right now. But oh my goodness. I think the lesson comes from the you've got to keep going, you know? You do. Um, I, I, I'm just writing Cows something. And all. I'm, I'm writing something at the moment where I'm talking about this this person who has bounce. This character who has bounce, you know, and, and, and he's in this dreadful situation, but his bounce won't let him despair and his bounce is saying to him what's next and he's saying there's no next and his bounce says there is always a next and I think that's that's the thing you know there is always a next and yeah. you have to decide where you will go with that next yeah it is always absolutely and I think that's why I like adventures and travel and anything where there's adrenaline and it's because and I, I love it when things go wrong, even though it's my worst nightmare. So I'll do everything I can to prevent anything going wrong. And I plan to the nth degree for everything, um, which comes from having made so many mistakes in the past. Uh, mm. But when they do go wrong, it's like, oh, great. Okay, thank goodness. Now I know what the thing was going to be that went wrong. And now we deal with it. And now we can keep going. And it's happened now. So I don't have to worry about it happening anymore. I don't know if that makes sense. So I'm always worried the problem will come. It, it so then when it goes wrong I'm like oh good now we can just think on the spot like we get a virus you know it was like okay I was worried about all this stuff to do with launching books because of you know all the things around that and I spend all this time planning down to the to tiny details about what I'm going to do I'm worried about this and I'm worried about that and then a virus hits and I'm like oh okay well now no one knows now we're all in the same boat and we can just make it up as we go along and I love I that think, I think that's that's something that I've learned. Now, maybe this is something you learn as you get older. I don't, I don't, for me, this is something I've learned as I get older, as I got older, um, to make it up as I go along more, you know, to, to, re, to plan like crazy, because I do plan like crazy. <laughs> but then to, once you've got that plan done, you've got to let go. And, and it's a bit like going into a school and talking to a bunch of kids. Yes. You oh, have yes, no is. idea how it's going to go. You've got no idea what the teachers have done to prepare or anything like that. And I used to be, it used to really freak me out if, if stuff went wrong. Um, but now I've learned to, it, it's like riding a wave, you know, you, you, you ride along. And one of the things that I love doing when I go into schools is um, when I do a talk, not, not so much a workshop, but when I do a talk is one of the things I do is we make up a story together. So... Um, so I, I give them an, a premise, which is usually something to do with the story, the, the book I'm talking about. Um, so what I've been talking about for the last year, of course, is the rogues. And uh, the, the main characters in the rogues, there's a girl called Duckling and her grandfather, uh, Lord Rump, who is a total rogue, you know, incredibly dishonest um, and incredibly charming. And so I talk about, well, I know what I did with these characters, but it would be really interesting to see what else might happen to these characters. So we start talking about what we need for an exciting story. And, um, and, and then I ask them for, okay, what, what is Lord Rump? What are Lord Rump and Duckling trying to do? And usually it's the kids come up with something like rob a bank or um, steal something or, you know, something illegal. I, I specify that it has to be something illegal because that's the sort of person Lord Rump is. And then we set out to make up this story and it goes, it goes in the most amazing directions. And, and I couldn't have done this 10 years ago. You know, 10 years ago, I would have been hanging on too tight to have let the story go where it wants to go. And now yeah. I write it and it is such fun. It is enormous, enormous fun. Um, and, and the kids take these stories in the most ridiculous and the most amazing and the most hilarious in, uh, directions. And it's huge fun and they have fun too. So I yeah. think that's, that's part of that. It's like you say, it's like the virus. You, you kind of go, okay, all right. Everything is now up for grabs. <laughs> I have no idea what's going to be happening in a week. So yeah. let's just 
let's just ride it and see and not make too many plans. Yeah, and let go of that control, especially with kids thinking of stories and you never, you really never know. I've done that with adults, an adult class, and you never know what people are going to come up with. And I always, I do have the instinct to interrupt. And I've taught for years, but not creative things. So I never, not only, oh, only a long, very long time ago in a very minor way, but I haven't taught people about writing or being creative. I haven't done any of that yet. So it was more, I had to lead students in a certain direction to get them to a point that they had to be, you know, training teachers or, you know, that sort of thing rather than um, this. And I'm open, I do open discussions. I know how to do an open discussion about a book. Obviously I've taught literature, but to let people just make up stories. And then I'm thinking I'll be wanting to step in going, yeah, but what if they, I don't want them to do that. No, I don't like that kind of thing. You know, I don't want to control it. So I, I, it might take me a few years before I'd be able to do that, I think. But when you, when you do, um, it, it is such fun. The, I, I do have limits. I do, um, and my main limit is they're not allowed to kill off the main characters, you know, because there is always some kid who says, and then uh, the, the whole building blows up and, and Lord Rump and Duckling die. And, yes, and they're I, very no, Shakespearean. It's like, no. Absolutely can't do that because that stops the story and we're not stopping yeah. the story yet. So, so that, I won't allow that. Um, <laughs> I, I, sometimes I will pull back if it starts to get too violent. Um, yeah. I will pull back. But often, you know, they'll they'll say, you know, and then he gets a machine gun, and <laughs> my God, <laughs> a machine gun. Okay, he's got a machine gun. What happens next? So, um, it's just it, the fun of it is going along with it, I think, and yeah. and seeing exerting this much control, but no more. Yes, yes. Uh, one day. One day I'll get the courage to do it. <laughs> I wish I'd had you come to my school when I was a student so I could have been on the other end because we never had an author visit ever in my all my schooling. But no, um, I don't think I did either. No. So I think if you've never had the experience, then you've got to kind of start from a different place because you don't know what it felt like as a child um, to have I that. Authors, I don't think authors did school visits when I was a kid. Um, no, it's possible. I, I think they, they kind of, it was... That was so different, wasn't it? It was, yeah. it was enormously different. Authors weren't accessible. No. They were, you know. Or if you, you could write to them. You could write to them. Yeah. But, but they, I, I don't, I think they just wrote their books and handed them over to their publisher. There wasn't that sort of going around and promoting your books wasn't part of being an author in that same way. I don't think. No. And I may not have wanted to know an author at that time because I never had. And so the idea that they were real people or alive, because I always assumed they were probably not alive anymore. I don't know why. It was just one of those things. They were just this mystical thing. Whereas now it's very much more like you have an author and you follow their books and you, they are real people that you can access in some way or even just look up a video of them or that kind of thing. I mean, we, you know, we just didn't even, well, there wasn't YouTube. It's not like you could have looked up. <laughs> Your favourite writer. And... I'm not even sure that I was aware of authors. You know, books. No. books. I, I was aware of books. Books are what concerned me. Yeah. I, I don't know whether I ever thought of somebody sitting down and writing them. And yet I wrote, you know, like I wrote from as soon as I learned to write, basically. Um, and yeah. so I was aware of that possibility of writing as an occupation. But I, I don't remember ever thinking, oh, you know, I love this author's books. It was, oh, here's a book about a horse. I'm going to read this. <laughs> and where's the next book about a horse? Yep. Yes. yes. Oh, no, oh, my goodness. I think I could talk to you for about five hours, to be perfectly honest. And I feel like we so I did scratch the surface. So we'll probably have to do another one in a while. And as um, Clara comes further into the public, we'll have to have another chat but thank you so much for coming on oz chat it's been absolutely delightful and i'm so excited to meet clara oh thank you anna it's been lovely talking to you and thank you for inviting me bye, bye.